Well, we've been in a series now, which we're wrapping up uh, tonight. And so uh, we, we've been kind of focused on this thing, that you're in a spiritual war for the souls of humanity and for your very own soul as well. It's a big deal. Everyone that has put your faith in Jesus, you are at war. Some of you are more aware of that than others, but it doesn't change the fact we're in a war. And so we've got to be aware and uh, know that our, we have an enemy, the enemy, the devil. He is strategic. He is evil. He is organized, and his vast army is on the prowl. They are working against the people of God. Uh -huh. But the good news is that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is greater Amen? He is greater. That's what we've been singing about today in, in our worship service. He is greater than any sin. We sang no sin, no stain, no, no shame, no guilt. He is greater than it all. He is God, and he is in us, and we are in Christ if you put your faith in him. So, so that's why Paul writes to us in our, our key passage, Ephesians 6, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord. So we're, we're in a series, we're talking about the armor of God, but our strength is the Lord. Our power is the Lord. And it comes in standing in the armor that Jesus has provided for us, that he has worn himself. Today, why don't you turn in your Bibles, if you've got a Bible, to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And we, we generally read in the NLT translation of the Bible. Uh, but get that out on your, on your smartphone or tablet or, or on your Bible. And I, I like for you to be able to see what comes before and after or be able to read the verses again for yourself. So this armor that we're talking about, it's the armor of God. So in the past, we've always kind of thought, oh yeah, it's the armor that God gave us. Well, no, it's the armor, uh, it's his armor. It's Jesus' armor, the armor of the Messiah that he has worn, tested out, made a way, and he is giving that to you and me. So we stand in his armor, in his power, in his might. We stand in him, in his armor. So you can stand firm against all the strategies of today. We're on the last part of the armor. Today I want to talk to you about uh, how Paul said, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. That's what we're talking about today, which is the Word of God. The, the amazing thing is that the Bible is the written Word of God, but Jesus is the living Word of God. He is called the Word. If you look at uh, the Gospel of John, the biography of Jesus written by John, John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. It's a mysterious thing. But he is the living Word of God. So, this last piece of armor is Jesus. Just let that sink in. We're not just out there fighting on our own, just trying to white knuckle it, just trying to, you know, be as brave as we can against that bad old devil. That's not how it is. We are in Christ. Amen. We are in Christ, and he is in us. And so when we battle, we're battling in Christ, in his power, in his strength. Yes, Your power comes from standing in the victory Jesus already won for you. He won the war. But you and I still need to fight the daily battles. I, I read a, a, an article about a, a Japanese soldier who after World War II didn't know it was over. And he was there in the Philippines and he just kept fighting for years that battle. Uh, and it, uh, it, it's so crazy how he wasn't aware that the battle was over. And so many times we're not aware that the battle's still going. <laughs> And we just kind of lay our weapons down and, and, and just go about our business not knowing that we can be armed. You and I can be armed in the armor of God and we can be strong. I do want to clarify, you're not fighting for victory. Jesus won the victory. Right. You're fighting from a position of victory. Yeah. Still fighting battles, but it's just a different mindset and a different position. You're fighting from victory. 
I I love what Pastor Savchuk wrote in his book, Fight Back. Uh, When he compares what we are going through today in in terms of spiritual uh, warfare to what the Israelites went through when Moses led them out of Egypt, this is what he said. Bondage is bad. Battle is good. Bondage makes you a slave. A battle makes you a soldier. It's a different position. It's a different place. Bondage happens in Egypt, but catch this. Battles take place in the promised land. We have this erroneous idea. I must not be in the promised land because I'm having to fight battles. No, listen, that's where the battles are. A deliverer brought the people out of Egypt. There was no fighting on their part at all. All they did was hold out their hand for a handout as they went out of the nation. There was no battle on the part of the people. That was deliverance out of bondage. The battles happened once they got to the promised land. And God says, I gave you this land. I gave it to you. In other words, the victory is won. Now go fight. It's just, it's counterintuitive. It's not, we think, oh, if he's given us the victory, it should be easy. That's just not how it is because the end of all time has not come yet. The consummation of the kingdom of God is still ahead of us. We've had creation, fall, and salvation, redemption, but we haven't had consummation yet. We haven't had eternal glory yet. That's coming. And in between now and there is battles. The battles take place in the promised land as we are taking back territory that the enemy has stolen from us physically and spiritually. I'm fired up, man. I am fired up. It's the last week on this series, and I just don't even want to see it go. Although I am really excited about next the series that starts next week, Comfort and Joy. Oh, that's just what we need from the Lord right now in this season. So we're going to take a little different approach. So if you've been kind of like, I'm battling, come next week for comfort and joy. All right. And we're just going to get in the Lord's presence and find some comfort and joy from from his word. We've been talking about every, every Sunday, when you stand and fight in the armor of God, you are well suited for victory. You're well suited for victory. Listen, you're, you're on the winning side. Right. Don't you be thinking all down like, oh, no, how can I make it? Uh, you are well suited for victory if you're standing in the armor of God, the armor that Jesus provided. Okay, I'm going to jump into today's story. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And this takes place right after Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And this, this was no ordinary baptism. Uh, you, uh, if you know the story, maybe you don't all know the story, but if you know the story, this was when God the Father in an audible voice, Jesus comes up out of the baptism water, God the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then, so he, he declares who Jesus is, the son of God. And then the Holy Spirit comes and descends. The Father declares, the Spirit descends on him like a dove. This is a very powerful, uh, sort of the world announcement uh, of Jesus uh, as he began his, his uh, adult ministry. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. That word is tempted, tested, tried there by the devil. See, we have this idea in mind, well, if I'm in the promised land, it's easy, man. Just drink an orange crush all day long. It's easy. But that's just not how it works. So Jesus has the declaration of the Father, the ascension of the Spirit all over him, and he's all power and glory. And behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then the Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tested and tried and tempted by the enemy, by the devil. Verse 2, for 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. Both gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, tell us the number of days. And, you know, I'm not all into Bible numerology and every number, you know, seven and a half, that means something. I'm not into that. But when you see the number 40, okay, come on. There are some significant things that happened in 40. One of them being Moses went on the mountain 
and got the law of God. And he was up there fasting for 40 days up on the mountain. And so here's Jesus fasting in the wilderness, just like that mountain was in the wilderness for Moses, fasting for 40 days and nights. So I, you, you can't help but see the parallels uh, the, the Israelites also wandered in the desert in the wilderness for 40 years. And so here's Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. It would be interesting to see if there are some, some parallels because the Israelis wandering the desert for 40 years were being tested and tempted and tried. And now here's Jesus going through the same thing. Verse 3, during that time, the devil came and said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Okay, remember, Jesus has just gone through a, he is in the middle of a 40-day fast. He's hungry physically. He's on fire spiritually. <laughs> and the devil says, if you're, if you're the son of God, prove it. Do a trick. Show me something. Do some magic. Turn this stone into a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live, and that word means to be sustained. They do not continue to live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Interesting that the Israelites, during their 40 years in the desert, they failed the food temptation. They failed the food test and trial multiple times with God. Wah, I want some onions. Wah, I don't like manna. They failed. And here's Jesus going through the same test, and he succeeds. So that's very cool. A nice contrast there. Um, how many times do you and I complain to God when we don't get what our flesh desires? That might be a test. Verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. Now, the uh, other translations say the pinnacle of the temple. And uh, pinnacle can mean the highest point or the farthest outreaching point. And uh, some scholars believe that, that the devil took him, whether it's you know, physically or, or in the spirit, to this point, the place where the most people would have seen him the corner of the, the temple um, compound where, that was at an intersection. That's, that's one thought. And the devil like, take, takes him to this place where everyone would see him and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, now I want to hold up, hold up right here. Do you see what's happening here? The devil's not an idiot. He is an adversary. He is powerful, he is smart, he is strategic. So the first temptation, he comes to Jesus and says, prove, do me a trick, prove that you're the son of God. God give me some bread. Jesus' answer was with scripture. So the next time, devil goes, oh, it's about scripture. Okay, I got some scripture. He's changing his tactics. He's watching what Jesus is doing. He's studying the son of God and going, let's try something else. Let's see if I can trick him with some scripture. Do you, do you think that he might be doing that to you and I too? If he did it to Jesus? Absolutely. And the devil brings him some scripture and says, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. That is Psalm 91. Yeah. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Uh, just interesting, I don't know the significance here, but all three times in all three temptations, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. It's the, the first section of the law that talks about love between God and his people. It's, it's pretty cool. I don't, I don't know if that's why, but uh, it just happens to be. So the Israelites, it says, tested the Lord their God. I believe it's Numbers chapter 21. They tested the Lord their God at Meribah, uh, this uh, place called Meribah. And they, when they complained against God and Moses, how many times do you and I test God's patience? And Jesus says, it is written, do not test the Lord your God. <laughs> now, verse 8, next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain. Interesting, isn't it? Another parallel with Moses. A very high mountain and showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says, I will give it all to you if you will kneel down and worship me. Now, it doesn't say this in the text, but I believe what the devil showed him was the Persian Empire, Washington, D.C., 
the Vatican, the European Union, Germany. I, I believe he showed him Japan. I believe he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, past, present, future. And, and Satan is saying, I am the God, small g, of this world. I can give you these kingdoms. He says, one little caveat, if you will kneel down and worship me. Satan is saying to Jesus, if you worship me, then I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. And this is what Jesus says, get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Amen. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Again, the Israelis continually cycled back to worship false gods and idols uh, as they were wandering through the, the desert and just <laughs> forever. Uh, and God had to bring them back each time. How many times do you and I let other things take God's place in our hearts? If anything else has God's place in your heart, we don't think of it this way because we haven't made, we haven't crafted an idol to power, love, success, relationships, money. We haven't, we don't have like a little silver thing we've shaped, but that thing, if it has God's place in our heart, we are worshiping that thing, that person, that situation. And Jesus said, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus, in these temptations, shows us that it's wrong to try to get a right result through a sinful shortcut. Because listen, there's nothing wrong with having some bread to eat. There, there's nothing wrong with that. But remember, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to fast. This was, this was he, obedience for Jesus was fasting during this time. Obedience wasn't doing a trick and making a, turning a rock into bread. So that would have actually been disobedient. So a, a bread is, you know, eating bread, it's, it's a right thing, but in this case, it was a wrong way to get there. Um, in Psalm 91, God promises to protect us. That promise that the devil quoted to Jesus was for God's people and for Messiah as well. Uh, and uh, for, uh, so God's promise to protection, like that's a good thing, that's a right thing, but protection comes through trusting God, not testing God. Our protection lies in trusting God, not testing God. Jesus knew he was coming to be crowned. He expects to be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. He will be crowned with many crowns, as the, the old song said. But that would flow out of obeying God the Father all the way to the cross. So do you realize what the devil was saying? Like, it, it, we, we might just look at this temptation and go, oh yeah, the devil's just offering him a lot of money and glory. Like, he's offering him, you know, the kingdoms of this world. But what he was really offering him was a shortcut around the cross. Because G all the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's going to happen on the other side of the cross. So the devil was saying... This is a big temptation. Yeah. Devil is saying, I can get rid of the cross for you. And you can be king right now. Just worship me. Right results, king of kings. Wrong way to get there. Yeah. Sinful shortcut. Each time Jesus was tempted, he took up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Yeah. And he stabbed holes in those, in those temptations and they lost their appeal. He was able to get Pat to overcome and, and to not cave to any of those temptations. He reminded himself and the devil what God's will in each temptation is. So the, if I could wrap up this message in just one sentence, it would be this. When you counter temptation by quoting the Bible, you drive away the devil. Amen. And if, I hope that you're a note taker that you're taking notes in your phone or taking note in your journal or something. But man, I encourage you to take down scriptures and I encourage you to take down phrases that the, the Holy Spirit just highlights to you. Maybe it's not every phrase, but man, I hope that, that you will uh, just take that extra step and, and jot down some notes. When you counter temptation by quoting the Bible, you drive away the devil. And I love that we're ending this series about the armor of God with this. This is so great. It began 
with the belt of truth, and it ends with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. In, in terms of the pieces, I almost, I was tempted to go one more week and just add on the next verse, which is, and pray in the Spirit at all times. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> but perhaps in the spring, maybe, maybe we'll come back. I, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, when you counter temptation by quoting the Bible, you drive away the devil. The problem is we often neglect God's word in our lives. And negligence results in weakness. Negligence results in weakness. So many times the devil offers a shortcut or a workaround, an attraction or a distraction. It's what the author Doug Wade calls a juicy temptation in his book, The Armor of God, The Whole Armor of God. The devil points out the opportunity to cheat on the exam. Hey, if you, there's a little opportunity here. You could cheat on this. The devil offers a temptation to sleep with a boyfriend before you're married or the urge to cover up something that you've done wrong by lying about it. Maybe you're tempted to judge someone else for their sin or to hate someone who's wounded you in some way. How do you respond to these strategies of the devil? Well, the first offense that often comes to our mind when you're debating, do I, oh man, I'm kind of tempted to do this thing. I know it's not right, but I'm kind of tempted to. Usually our first defense, like of talking yourself out of it is this, well, what if I got caught? Huh. What would my friends think if I did this or if they found out? What, what would the people at church think about this? And so based on those rationale, we think, oh man, I better not. Ugh, I, I might get caught. I, I better not. And so many times we weigh the costs of getting caught instead of waging war and getting free. So many times, that's our default, man. We just weigh, we weigh the, the cost of, of getting caught instead of waging war and getting free. That's what we ought to be doing. These are human reasonings. And it's like fighting with a feather instead of stabbing with a sword. The devil is a polished debater. So if you're going to get in a debate with him and you're thinking, man, I don't know if I should, I kind of want to do this, but uh, I might get caught. He's going to say, you won't get caught. Here, in fact, here's, here's three ideas on how you won't get, get caught. I mean, he, he is going to jump all over that. He is watching you just like he was watching Jesus. But what if instead you were to take up your sword, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and you fight those temptations I just listed by quoting verses like this. You're, you're, you're tempted to cheat on an exam or to take something that's not yours. And you say, but God's word says you must not steal. It's just a little different way than, than maybe we tend to, to use the word of God in temptations. But it's how Jesus used it. You're tempted to steal and you say, but God's word says you shall not steal. Uh, God's word says sex is only for those who are married. Genesis 2.24, God's word says, speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. The devil can't argue with that. He can't argue with that. There's, you've given him no wiggle room there. If your goal is to know and do what God has shown us, living the life that God has shown us in his word, the Bible, then there's nothing to debate. If you're just saying, but God's word says, there's... There's no, there's no argument. The devil can't, he, he can't fight that. Right. It's like, yeah, you're right. That is what it says. So if we're going to do that, I can't argue with that. Yeah, you're right. So, so there's nothing to debate. Whether you're going to get caught, it doesn't matter. Whether anyone sees you, it doesn't matter. Because that's not the goal. The goal isn't getting away with stuff. The goal is having a godly life. Blessed by God. So it doesn't matter whether everyone else is doing it. It, it doesn't matter. That's that because that's not the goal to do what everyone else is doing. The goal is to live a relationship with God and, 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 and fight battles in the power of God. What matters is what God has said. That's what matters. Well, what did God say? That's, that's what matters. That's the bottom line. The word of God is a sharp sword. When you counter temptation by quoting the Bible, you drive away the devil. It's hard work, though. Yep. It's hard work to even do what I'm suggesting we do. It's, it's hard work. 
Uh, there, uh, there is, uh, uh, that's why Paul calls it a battle. It's a battle. You've got to anticipate what temptation, temptations are coming, and you've got to be ready with specific verses. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, 13, it says, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So already, th- uh, this, is, this is kind of a, a, another approach, and I think maybe this is maybe a little bit more common, but when you're feeling tempted, you can quote that verse. And the devil is saying to you, you might as well cave, you know you're going to. And you can say, no, my God has made a way out of temptation, so I have a way out, and I'm taking it. <laughs> Bye, devil. <laughs> and his name is Belisha. Bye, Felicia. (laughs) Fortunately, Jesus paved the way for you and me. In Hebrews 2.18, it says, Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Now we know why the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. Because he has suffered it. He has made a way. He has shown us you can overcome. He did. So in his power, you can overcome. In Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, it says, Jesus understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. We will find grace to help us when we need it most. So when you're feeling defeated, come boldly to the throne of grace. And there's everything that you need is there in God. Jesus told a parable about a farmer planting the word of God in people's hearts, in different people in different life situations. But some of the seeds fell upon along the footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Now Jesus explained the meaning of this in Matthew 13, 19. He said, The seed, that's God's word, that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. So the evil bird in this parable, this story, is the devil. And he wants to keep you from being fed, encouraged, empowered by the word of God, by the Bible. And the devil knows he cannot win against God's word, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So the devil will try to distract you, to keep you too busy, to keep you tired right now and zoning out, even during this message, or to make you think that you can't understand God's word for yourself, so why even try reading it? Because he wants to snatch God's word away from you. So this is what you do. Don't feed the bird. (laughs) Don't feed the bird. Feed yourself the word of God. So there's nothing for him to snatch away lying around. Don't leave your Bible lying around unused. Because as, as Pastor Sabchuk says, negligence results in weakness. So feed yourself. This is the action step. Feed yourself on God's word. Feed yourself on God's word. Feed yourself on God's word for yourself. Not just a message uh, every week, but man, it's so good. Like this is one of the great ways because you're hearing someone really emphasize it and bring in different verses from around the Bible about the same topic. It's very good, very helpful, but it's, there's, that's just one hour a day, a, a week. There's more. There's more for you. So here's some opportunities at NFC. Read a chapter a day using our NFC Bible reading plan on the app. If you don't know where to read, we're going to take you on a journey in different places in the Bible, places maybe that you wouldn't normally go to because we need the whole Bible. We need all of it, all of it. And so we're going to take you there, and we're going together as a group. Uh, We're just about finished with Galatians. Oh, Galatians 5 yesterday. Oh, my goodness. I have have underlined most of that chapter and double underlined my super favorite verses in Galatians 5. That was yesterday's reading. It's so good. Oh my goodness, and, and I, I already know what's coming in chapter 6. You're going to be so encouraged when you, when you read it. It's going to be good. So read a, read a chapter a day. Get yourself in a connect group. 
connect group, I, man, I'm telling you, I love being with my guys on Wednesday and just being with the guys and gals on, on Sundays. And, and that season will come again, uh, taking a little Christmas break right now. But con- get, get yourself in a connect group where we discuss the Word of God. It's a good opportunity for you to sharpen your sword. Meditate on the Bible. Journal on it. Memorize it. Discover verses that apply to temptations you frequently face. If you just Google this, Bible verses about blank. I think, I think it's, it's, it's something like open Bible or something. I think open Bible. And it just has, uh, people have just written in their favorite verses about that topic. So if you say verses to, um, to fight the temptation of lust, you just Google it and you'll have a hundred verses right there. Choose the one that speaks to you that God's highlighting to you. Memorize it and now you're ready. Right. Now you just sharpened your sword because you know that temptation's coming back, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. You know it's coming back. So, but now you're ready. Right. Jesus was ready and he overcame. He just stabbed the devil. Boink, boink, boink. Like he stabbed him. <laughs> he, he didn't just swat at him with a feather. He stabbed him. Like get out of here, devil. You can do that too. Yeah. In his armor and in his power. Feed yourself. Starve the bird. (laughs) Get the word of God in you yourself. When you counter temptation by quoting the Bible, you drive away the devil. That's what Jesus did, and he set the example. Would you stand? If you're in the room, would you stand? Online, if you could stand too, I encourage you to change your position. Uh, That's that's been my experience. When when I'm watching online, man, I I want to lean in, be engaged. We're going to pray. And so this is a very, very important time. I want everybody to to engage, lean in. Why don't you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Jesus, you taught us to pray. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And so, Jesus, we are praying the Lord's Prayer right now over our lives. May your kingdom come in my finances. May your kingdom come in in my thought life. May your kingdom come in my relationships. May your kingdom come. May your will be done in those things as it is in heaven. Don't let us yield to the evil one. Don't let us yield to temptation. But rescue us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, Lord. Yours, you are higher, you are greater, so much greater. You are greater, you are greater. Online or in the room, are you, fa- we're gonna stay in prayer, stay in prayer, but are you facing temptations? Let me see your hand, my hand's up. I'm always facing temptations. There's so many out there. Oh my goodness. Temptations for shortcuts, temptations for sins. Oh man, there's always, yeah. You can put your hands down. I'm gonna pray for you in just a minute. Do you need to grow in your use of the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit? Can I see your hands? I'm going to pray for you. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm glad. I, almost everybody's raising their hand in the room. Well, I, I hope so. I, I want to grow until I, I, I take my final breath. You can put your hands down. Last one. Are you willing to put in some effort? Can I see your hand? You know Jesus put in some effort reading the Bible. I mean, he's ready to quote all of Deuteronomy to the devil at a moment's notice. That took some effort. Yeah, you can put your hands down. I just want to pray for you. So Lord, I thank you for the honesty in this room and in those that are watching online as well. Lord, that we would raise our hands and say we're facing temptations. Thank you, Lord. We can be real with one another. We're the family of God. We are the army of God. We're, we're together. We're teammates. We're in this together. We're walking together. No one is perfect, not even me. No one is perfect. No one is exempt from temptations. Even Jesus, you, the Son of God, were tempted by the devil. You were tested and tried and tempted by him. But you are without sin. So I pray, Lord, that we would walk in your armor, in your power, that we would stand firm and strong in your ability, in your mighty power. And then after the battle, we'll be standing strong. So, Lord, I I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would help us to grow in our handling of the Word of God. Help us to interpret it right. Dear Lord, help us. Help us to memorize it. Help us to get it in us, Lord God. Help us to put forth the effort to know your Word, not just as a mental exercise, not to get an A plus in Bible learning, but to get the armor of God on us in battle. Lord God, help us to have your word at the, our, re, at the ready because we don't know when an attack's coming. Help us to have that sword ready, that we're ready 
to, to, to bring up the verse that would just send the devil fleeing. So help us, Lord God, to battle well, strong, in Jesus' name. And one final invitation to prayer. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, e even in the room, I, I, I know many of you, but I don't know where everybody is spiritually. And if, if you're not sure you're saved, then you're probably not. Let's get you saved right now. Let's, let's, get, let's put your faith in Jesus. Let's get sure right now in this moment, online or in the room. So if, if, uh, I, I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus, to become his apprentice, to follow him. And that's why we're, we're following him as apprentices, all of us. I'm an apprentice in the, in the armor of God and, in, and following Jesus. I want to invite you to be his apprentice. How do you do that? Say it with me, church. Do you know how do you do it? Turn from your what? Turn from your what? Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. Let him what? Let him what? Lead. If you want to do that today and become a Christian, but become a follower of Christ, would you raise your hand right here in the room or online? You can raise your hand as well to God. Yep, yep, I see you. That's good. Some, some people just making sure. I'm, I'm so glad of that. I, I'd love to just coach you in a prayer. Would you just repeat after me? Or, uh, online or in the room, repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus I, invite I invite you into my life. Into my life. Please, forgive me Please forgive me of my sin, of my sin. and make me, make me new. I choose, I choose to, follow to follow you and be your apprentice, be your apprentice. Starting, now. starting now. In Jesus' name, Jesus name. Amen. 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 And if you put your faith in Jesus today, we just applaud you. We cheer you on. That is awesome. If you just, whether you're in the room or online, if you just prayed that prayer, put your faith in Jesus, would you text faith in Jesus to the phone number 97,000? Faith in Jesus to the phone number 97,000. I want to hear from you and I want to encourage you. Thanks for being here today. Isn't it so great that God did not leave us powerless? He gave us a weapon. What's the weapon? The Word of God, that's right. Thank you, Pastor Garen, for bringing that message. So we want to stay connected with you guys throughout the week. We really do. Um, for those of you who are online, would you just follow us? Would you um, subscribe to our channel, like us, so that other people can find us too uh, when they search for us? Also, if you are a kid, we have Kids Church online videos. Those are showing up on our YouTube channel. So if you're on our YouTube channel, you're already there. Next very important thing. I'm going to quiet down so you will listen to me really quick. <laughs> we are wrapping presents after service today. It is going to be awesome. It's going to be a fun time. We brought cookies. There's, it's going to be great. Um, so anyone who can help, please help us. We have 500 gifts. So if we all take 30, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if we all do as many as we can, it'll just make a huge dent in it. It'll be awesome. And it's for an amazing cause. Guys, if you've seen these gifts in, for this year or years past, they are a blessing to these kids. So let's bless them by just wrapping them up really nice, really nice. It was so good to see you guys this week. I can't wait till next week. God bless.